reference to Michael's book. It kind of starts out and sums it up. During the next 10 years, the human race is destined to finally discover the facts about its true origins and its destiny. And it may come far quicker than 10 years, Michael, but I think you're right. right. We are uh, literally teetering on the edge of uh, so many of these old paradigms of obfuscation, lies, and, and yep. deceit and distortion uh, falling apart. The Internet's playing a role on it, but there is a, a great awakening among people who are interested in that kind of thing. This is what happens, I saw it in Belfast. The idea yeah. is that sometimes people need a good kick up the you-know-where yeah. in order to, to get uh, back to the original principles that undergird our societies. Yeah. We slip away from that. We're going to go through, uh, I'm afraid, a lot of very uh, deadly and, and disastrous times before we get there. But, but that's uh, all right. See, what we have to understand, that the people of the that's light the have normal to cycle. Fear. Right. No, that's true. That's a normal cycle. It's a normal cycle. I'm so glad to hear you say that because I keep, you know, uh, when I do a talk, people will come over to me and go, you know, and I'm very solution-oriented. I, I don't ever stop without giving major solutions, but still you have people who are in fear, and it's like the, you know, you know the old uh, cop dramas where they say, if you're not guilty, you have nothing to fear? Right. Well, it's the same thing that goes now historically. If you are connected, if you're centered, if your moral body and your spiritual body and your emotional body are sound, and you have not climbed on others, and your your karma is in good shape, you have nothing to worry about, no matter if it's earth changes. Because, again, you see, there's a whole culture out there in the media to create a paranoid society. You know, we have a situation out in the world in which they're desperate to have us fearing everything. You know, it, it, all you hear about is identity theft and, you know, germs in our yeah. houses and mm -hmm. the coming epidemics and, oh, my mm -hmm. God, terrorists under the bed and, you know, food is Im impure and weather patterns are getting distorted. And, no, and people just shiver under the bed without realizing, hang on a minute, this is all disseminated for a purpose in order to get you to be in, in paranoia, to fear, to be mm -hmm. uh, begging government to save your ass. You know, we don't understand that a lot of this is t totally unreal. And, and, what all, and, and all delivered, all injected, the, the masses are being inoculated with all of this crap right. uh, it's via a diet. Tele by television. Sure, It's a diet. It's a drip-feed diet. David Icke calls the television the hypnotist in the corner, you know, and he's so right. Yeah. It's a, a situation in which we are being drip-fed. I mean, you know, we have to realize that this is a very... What, what, uh, Aldous Huxley, who is one of the prime movers in this conspiracy, he called it a dictatorship without tears. You know, I have a, would you mind if I read a small quote from him so that no, people can understand? No, go ahead. Uh, Aldous, Aldous, uh, Huxley, not to be confused with George Orwell, friends, if you're not well read, uh, don't, right. don't confuse the two. And the reason why I'm reading these quotes is because I want to emphasize that, uh, we talked about scholarship earlier on. One, one of the, in, in life, when you are into these alternative subjects, you're often termed a conspiracy nut. But you see, what these detractors don't understand is that if you look up the word conspiracy in a proper sociological dictionary, like the Collins Dictionary, mm -hmm. or get online and look up the word conspiracy, it will tell you that a conspiracy is only something that is reprehensible if, for, if, if there's two things that happen. One is that if it is too zealously or overzealously delivered, mm -hmm. and if it is without any backup, okay, that, that is what is reprehensible about any conspiracy. Well, as you know from the people on your show, and, you know, in my work also. You know, yes, I do believe there's a conspiracy out there. I don't believe it's all coincidence. Oh, I don't, yeah, well, look, here's the bottom line. We don't need to be labeled conspiracy theorists. We we don't believe in conspiracy theory. We believe in conspiracies because the world is run, has been, and That's always right. will be run on conspiracy right. bases. And since there are detractors out there, I want to make sure that they understand fully that in my work specifically, uh, the delivery of these conspiracy facts is both eloquent and backed up by unbelievable proof. I go straight to the horse's mouth. I'm not so interested, like we talked earlier, about other writers in the genre. I go to the Carol Quigleys, and I go to the Colonel Mandel houses, and uh -huh. I go to the original sources, you know, the uh, Adam Weishaps and the Albert Pikes. Mm -hmm. I've gone to their work. These are the people who are the main movers in, in this. Uh, to, I've gone to the Freemasons and the Bilderbergers and their own work so that people are, it's not, they're not hearing anything from me. I'm not, you know, asserting any point of view. You, you're never going to hear that from me. Uh, as any great researcher, you're supposed to be a conduit, which is what you're saying. Right, and here is a perfect proof. Here's Aldous Huxley in his book, A Brave New World Revisited. He says the 21st century will be the era of the world controllers. The older dictators fell because they could never supply their subjects with enough bread, enough circuses, enough miracles and mysteries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Under a scientific dictatorship, education will really work. Most men and women will grow up to love their servitude and will never dream of revolution. 
there seems to be no good reason why a thoroughly scientific dictatorship should ever be overthrown. What he's saying there is that, I mean, two things come out of this. Not only is the man admitting cold-bloodedly that there is a conspiracy, mm-hmm. that they're working overnight to mm-hmm. enslave the human race, the man has the utter condescension to then say, but don't worry, folks, you're going to love it. You're going to like it. We're bending over backwards not only to enslave you, please understand, we're making a dictatorship with smile. We're going to make it a dictatorship with tears. You're going to love it, and you're going to love us for giving it to you. And in my work and other researchers' work, in the work of Jordan Maxwell, David Icke, others, we're trying to draw attention to the way in which this is done, because if you think you know the answers, you won't ask the question. And we have to discover the, the subtle and ingenious methodologies. You know, in my work especially, I go very much into showing you mm-hmm. what is the nature of these forces that control us, because we can't be free unless we're intimately aware of the kinds of psychic dictatorship that's being pervaded in our midst. Actually, the, the reason for them, as you say, doing this to us was literally to create servants, to have a race of people mm-hmm. that would serve, you know, them, because they a didn't serving want to class, be looking after themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Right. right, you sure? I got you. Go ahead. Yeah, the idea was that uh, when you come here and you're vastly advanced, you know, you want a slave, uh, a race of slaves. In the Popol Vuh, there's an incredible uh, quote about that. I mean, you find it in the Bible and you find it in the Book of Enoch. But in the Popol Vuh, this is for people who are interested in the South American um, aspect of this. In the Popol Vuh, it says, there's a quote, it says, Let us make him who shall nourish and sustain us. Mm. What shall we do to be invoked, to be remembered in earth? This is the God speaking, right? We have tried with our first creatures, but we could not make them venerate us. So then, let us try to make obedient, respectful beings who shall nourish and sustain us. Now, that's just one passage, which, first of all, tells us why it was of great interest to the Spanish conquistadors to be burning these books because if, if that's only an example of what was in them we know that the, they didn't want these chronicles to be letting us know who mm-hmm. was doing what to whom mm-hmm. but what that passage also brings out is that yes, you're right, they wanted servants they wanted slaves to help them this is what Zachariah Sitchkin's work brings out and in the Celtic tradition it's the same idea 